Throne and Liberty. Uh, I've seen like one or two things about this, so I'm kind of curious what it's going to be. One of the most exciting and highly anticipated upcoming good. MMOs for me scheduled to release this year is a game by the name of Throne and Liberty. That's insane if it's going to release this year. Like, bro, like that's in that's there's like 3 months left in the in the year. This shit's got to be like about to get released then. This is a third-person action combat MMO it got that tells oh, a few okay. noteworthy and interesting uh, features, Elden including Ray. a Look massive open world with dynamic weather that directly affects the enemies, your abilities, and even alters the terrain, huge mm -hmm. open field boss battles that require potentially up to hundreds of players to take on, castle sieges where you can control giant stone golems and smash walls, lots yeah, of different traversal that. options from mantling and climbing to grapple hooks and transforming into animals, a major focus on challenging cooperative PvE content, open world PvP with a PK system, and lots of other MMO elements that you would expect, capital cities to hang out with others, a big yeah, old sure. loot grind to engage with, and various other social activities. And I gotta say, from that first announcement trailer released last March, along with a handful of developer interviews since, this game is looking absolutely fantastic. Now, while wow. you be forgiven for thinking this was a new announcement, first officially revealed earlier this year, the truth is development began over a decade ago. Well, yeah, this game used to be the lineage successor, right? And then after a while, they were like, well, this is just not going to fucking happen. And so they renamed it. Yeah, this was going to be lineage. Yeah, look at this shit. Starting out as a top-down ARPG Diablo with some rather interesting gameplay mechanics. And as you can clearly see from recent footage, it is no longer anything like that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it used to be the same game. That's like, yeah, man, I remember, um, you, you, you know, like, that. it's like we had chess and then we turned it into, like, football. It's like, wait a <laughs> What do you mean? Like, how do you, how do you go from point A to point? It's like a totally different fucking game. This is a pretty interesting story all around, so we are yeah. going to dive into the long and strange I'm history of Throne this. Liberty's development, uh, how it's changed, and then it. also get into some of the specifics of what the current iteration is and why right. I am so excited and looking forward to checking out this game. Before we jump into any of that, though, a quick word from today's sponsor. Oh, today's video is sponsored by Purple War. This is a new is upcoming RTS win? that is heavily inspired by classic games in the genre. Hey <laughs> Warcraft 3. All right, we got it. So it's Warcraft 3 for your phone. Paying homage to titles like Starcraft, Command and & Conquer, and as you can likely already tell, Warcraft 3 as well. I think that if you showed this, if I showed this to my mom, and I, I was able to show it to her, and I would be like, do you remember playing Warcraft 3? She's like, yeah, I do. There it is. I bet she would have thought this was Warcraft 3. Straight they up. say the game has intuitive, easy to learn, and fast paced gameplay with a story campaign as well as online multiplayer that supports up to eight players and yeah. four versus four matches. There is this heavy medieval vibe and setting with the clearly Warcraft 3 inspired aesthetics, and it features the classic RTS gameplay loop that you would expect. You'll yeah, start sure. out gathering resources, building up your base, amassing an army, and working to eliminate your then enemies. You Purple War right. will be running its second free play test from now until August 7th. They are also playing planning a special event in appreciation of playtest participants, which they'll be revealing soon. So to learn more- So you've got like the humans and you've got like the, uh, the elves there. More about the game and check it out for yourself. Just use my link mm -hmm. in the video description below. Okay, so let's jump in and talk about what is so interesting and unique about this game. But first, I do want to touch on the history because Throne and Liberty has been in development for a very long time. Originally, it started out as a successor to Lineage, which if you don't know, Lineage was a medieval fantasy MMO developed by NCSoft that released back in 1998. Its sequel, yeah, it Lineage 2, ago. which was actually a prequel, launched in 2003. And then this new game that I was- I remember like seeing boxes for Lineage 2 all the time at games, uh, GameStop. All the fucking time. It's like, it was always in like one of those like center areas. I never played it though talking about today, Throne in Liberty started out as what was basically going to be Lineage 3. First yeah. revealed back in 2011 as Lineage Eternal, Twilight Resistance, the game, according to an Gadget article posted at the time, would take place in the same fantasy setting. I remember watching the clip of, the, uh, of this game. I thought it looked cool. 
And I remember thinking to myself, like, whatever happened to that game? Well, I remember there was like this game where they were fighting a bunch of guys on a bridge and it looked really cool. I wonder if it ever came out. Well, here it is. Yeah, it was like Lost Ark. As the previous two lineage games, but this one sports more of a Diablo-esque camera view and much more use of object-oriented gameplay. Looks in other words, like this Lost was Ark. a top-down action game similar in appearance to Diablo 3, although with a pacing that was a bit on the slower side with slower movement and slower attacks. And yeah. they had some rather unique ideas for gameplay mechanics. Lineage Eternal featured a drag and hold bit of combat where you would literally click and drag your mouse either in an arc or in a direction to strike enemies with certain abilities. They also emphasize the player's cool. ability to make use of objects in the environment. You could do things like pick up and throw jars or use a grapple hook to pull enemies towards you. That same grapple hook could also be used to navigate the environment, jumping over obstacles or swinging across gaps. This That's might cool. not sound like much today, but all of this looked to be a fairly interesting twist on traditional ARPG gameplay, yeah. especially back at the time. In the years following- This is like, uh, you've got to keep in mind, in 2011, Diablo 3 hadn't come out then. Diablo 3 came out in 2012 in like, I think it was May or June. That first reveal, the game had a series of playtests where they big collected deal. feedback and impressions from which they continue to work on, iterate, and improve the title. Over time, they made so many changes that in 2017, they decided to rename the game from Lineage Eternal, aka Lineage 3, to Project the Lineage, or as it is often called, Project TL for short. It would still be a top-down action game, but now looked way more modern with updated That's graphics, what I saw, effects, right and there. animations. This. On top of that, the game was fucking much badass. more fast paced. They removed the click and drag mechanics, opting for a more traditional hack and yeah. slash combat where you would just point your mouse in a direction and activate an ability. That's they also cool. really ramped up the cinematic feel of the game with a lot more wide camera pans and mm -hmm. sweeping vistas to break up the action, highlight certain enemies or environmental pieces. The overall appearance of the game actually looked quite similar to Lost Ark, a top down exactly. action MMO that Amazon recently published the Western version of. In fact, you could have told me that some of this footage was of Lost Ark and I yeah if you had told me that the footage was of Lost Ark beta I'd be like yeah yeah I could see yeah yeah for sure I would totally believe you it just looks that similar and for yeah. that reason these two games were considered direct competitors for quite some time so the game continued its development along this new direction for a few more years it's gonna be hard for a game to compete with Lost Ark that has that same play style because there's just so much established content that's another issue with like new MMOs. Everybody wants to play a new MMO, but nobody wants to start over getting the occasional gameplay and cinematic trailer, but then everything changed in 2019 and things went completely dark. The yeah. company held off on showing or talking about anything pertaining to the game. There was just no new updates. That was until a few months ago Whenever when in March, we yeah. were introduced to Throne and Liberty, the latest iteration of what was once Lineage Eternal. As you can see with the new naming, they've completely removed any Lineage branding. That's probably a good idea because like a lot of times people have like a like yes you're going to capitalize on nostalgic boomers but you're also going to potentially alienate new people that didn't play those old mmos and they think to themselves oh like oh is that like one of those old games right it's probably better to like make your own ip and design it independently and replaced it with Liberty. And of course, beyond changing names for the second time and ditching the lineage IP, it's also no longer a top-down Diablo-esque mm -hmm. hack and slash game. Instead, we've got a third-person action game with realistic visuals and combat that is reminiscent of something like Black Desert Online. This quite dramatic right. shift, according to NCSoft, actually happened around spring of three years ago. So around the same time where things went quiet. When they came to the realization that the original vision for the game was just no longer viable. Touch well, it's also that Lost Ark is already out and it's massively fucking successful. And like, they probably think to themselves, we can't compete with Lost Ark. Lost Ark is the biggest fucking, uh, it's one of the biggest MMOs in South Korea, it might be the biggest MMO in South Korea. It's got tons of fucking content. We can't beat that. We should do something different. It would, yeah, it would just be a worse Lost Ark, exactly. 
touching on this in an interview, they said, in the process of development, a lot of the original systems and content had to be adapted or removed to follow the current game trends. As a result, the gameplay also gradually became different from the original. We wrote a yeah. completely new story, and after this work, questions arose within the development team as well, like, should this be called Lineage? And thus, we are left with Throne and Liberty, a dramatically different game from its origins mm -hmm. in name and appearance. The game also looks and sounds fantastic from everything we've learned. I mean, there are just some stellar ideas for gameplay and systems and mechanics in this game. And after learning more about it and doing research, I am just so incredibly pumped. A lot more than when I first just watched that. Yeah, like, I think it has like something where it's like an Attack on Titan style, like, uh, like system where you can like turn into a siege giant and attack castles. That's pretty badass initial gameplay trailer like the gameplay trailers trailers flashy but it kind of just looks like bdo like that's the obvious reference but there's a yeah. lot going on with this game that's really really interesting okay, so what do we know about throne and liberty most of the available details for this game come from the initial reveal trailer but also a handful of developer interviews in the months since they describe throne and liberty as a next generation mmo for pc and console you will notice a lack of mobile in that description because yes this is one of the few new eastern developed mmos that's not i feel like this game is just too high in terms of graphics Graphical requirements to be a mobile game like it, it's just it's too high like it just can't happen also coming to phone so kudos there the developer has said that when I'm not of the mindset that a game being on a phone is fundamentally bad and I also don't think that more complexity makes a better game uh, I, I think that a game being available on the phone uh, it didn't hurt Fortnite from being one of the best games ever it didn't hurt Minecraft either so I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not of the mindset of that, but I also don't think that it needs to be on phone. When work began on Throne and Liberty, those three or so years ago, they set out with the goal of rethinking what values and features a next-gen MMO should have. They wanted to build an engaging world that players can immerse themselves yeah. in, while offering many different kinds of experiences and content that would cater to a wide range of players. Right. What sort of content will that include? Well, for starters, we know that Throne and Liberty will be primarily focused on offering challenging, cooperative PvE. The developer said that That's while good. many Existing NCSoft games focus on player competition, and that can be fun. Quote, the reality, however, is that many more players are more interested in overcoming well-designed challenges than competing. So, in making Throne and Liberty, we try to put in a lot of this challenging content. They yeah, I think that's a smart thing. Uh, the, the reality is that, like, a lot of people that play PvP games are probably not going to do a lot of MMO stuff because they're focused on being competitive in a game. They, you know, they want to be very good at League, they want to be very good at Valorant, or, you know, another one of the actual competitive games. And so the people that you end up getting that are like these super hardcore MMO PvPers oftentimes are like these weird fucking like school bully type people that just want to fuck over everybody else and like ruin their fun. And so if you make a game like that, it, it just creates a cycle of people being repeatedly alienated from the content. And also, like, PvP content is harder to get into because it's just simply harder in general. So, yeah, I mean, that's why. Uh, I think it's smart for them to focus on PvE content. But PvP should be a big focus, too. It's just that PvE should be bigger. I don't think that PvP doesn't matter at all went on to say that this can be seen most clearly in the game's boss fights, which can only be overcome by groups of players who fully understand the mechanics of their characters, the mechanics yeah. of the boss, and are able to execute on all of this properly. To be clear, although they've said that PvE will be a main focus, you can be sure that PvP is in the game as well. In oh, fact, we yeah. even know that there will be a PK system. In another interview, they mentioned having a PK system where killing other players hits you with this accumulating debuff called Evil Deeds. However, if you PK during the nighttime, you will not receive this debuff, presumably because no one can see what it is that you're doing. And to That's an interesting idea. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. That's a very interesting idea.
who you're doing it. So at the very least, this seems to confirm that open world PvP in some capacity will be a thing. In that same interview, they also touch on the fact that the game will support both small scale one-on-one -on -one fights where you have to skillfully and carefully engage with enemies between attacks, counters, and defensive skills, but will also have a lot of large scale group battles where it is best for people to stick and work together. And that yeah, whole- Exactly. I think that's important because again, it's kind of what I was talking about before about like what is an MMO where I think a lot of people want a shared world that they can play in and exist around other players, but they don't necessarily want to have to be, uh, you know, mandatorily playing with these people all the time. So it sounds weird and like almost counterintuitive that you want a lot of like good solo challenges and MMOs, but I think that's what a lot of people come to appreciate. And, and like the group content matters too, but having good solo challenges also really matters a lack of getting a PK debuff in the evening at nighttime when the sun's down, that also leads us into this game's next major feature. Okay, in Throne that? and Liberty, weather and time of day have huge gameplay implications. You could spend hours and hours farming in the same area, but things would continuously evolve based on a lot of parameters. Say you're out grinding monsters and then the wind starts picking up. This will have an actual effect on things like projectiles, reducing the range of bow attacks, for example. If the weather's good, and the sun is out, your lightning spells may only hit a single target. However, if it starts raining, that same lightning skill all of a sudden will start doing area of effect damage, hitting multiple targets. Whether and I worry about the implementation of something like that. It's one of those things that, like, whenever you have a group of guys talking and, like, thinking about the interactions that you could have with, like, oh, so, yeah, bro, so, like, fucking, like, imagine, like, if you shoot, like, a fucking lightning bolt, man, but, like, so it's raining and there's, like, conductivity through the water. It's like, you know, you throw a toaster in the bathtub and you're dead, right? So, like, imagine that, but, like, you shoot a lightning bolt and then, like, it hits five other dudes. And then the other guy's like, oh, my God, bro, that's so badass. And then maybe have it like do more damage or like do like an AoE pulse effect around them. It's like, oh yeah, bro, that's so good. And like you get together and you get, you start talking about how cool this stuff would be. But the reality is like, it's a lot different than that. It's not necessarily as exciting as you might imagine. And it's like people are waiting until there's some sort of weather effect or it becomes contrived or annoying. And it's like, a, it's... Like, I, I feel like, it, in a lot of ways, emergent player behavior is where developer dreams go to die. You have this dream and this great idea of everybody having these, like, cool weather effects. And what it really fucking turns into is people going around and, like, just going to wherever it's raining and abusing the shit out of it time of day will have an effect on which NPCs populate an area. There will be some creatures that only come out at night or only during big storms. And weather will impact the environment. They said, for yeah. example, that normally in siege warfare, this game's large-scale PvP, there will be several ways to infiltrate a castle, including the castle's underground sewer system. However, during a rainstorm, these areas can fill with water and become inaccessible, forcing you to find an alternate route. Similarly, changes in weather can open up or restrict access to dungeons or various parts of a zone world i could see that being annoying i uh, i think it'll we'll just have to wait to see like how how often these types of things rotate Bosses are also influenced by the weather. Some bosses may get stronger when it rains or weaker when the sun's out. And the weather changes what loot the boss drops. So there might be a staff that only drops from a boss during a lightning storm, which means you will want to wait to fight that boss until the proper weather conditions arise. What's more- I think that that's like, again, they should, do, they should, they should do the beta with this. They, they should try it out. They should even release the game maybe with this. But if it sucks, they should just get rid of it. Like, that's one thing that, like, I'm totally okay with developers taking big risks with, like, weird ideas like this. But I, I do have a big problem with, like, 
whenever they do that and then they're like oh well we don't want to backtrack on this it's like one of the core foundations of the game it's like blizzard did that with covenants uh, new world did that with like azoth travel uh like many cases of this happening i think those are two of the main ones that i can think of and uh, you know final fantasy did that you know they reversed it with like having every mount that can fly right that way people don't feel like they have to use certain mounts that only fly like I, I think just go in and make it to where people can uh, can try this out and play it. But if it's bad and it's creating bad gameplay loops, get rid of it. Yeah, PoE with Arc Nemesis. Yeah, yeah, they thought it was going to work. Players didn't like it. Or though is that players will have the ability to directly affect this weather and the time of day. If certain conditions are met, you will be able to trigger a solar eclipse, blocking out the sun, or call in a storm. This will be a high level ability, likely with a very long cooldown, That's and not something cool. that everyone has access to all of the time. But as you can imagine from yeah, that, the implications that's really cool. that the weather and time of day have, this is a very powerful tool. And I have to remind you that this is an MMO. So the idea of changing the weather or the time of day for everyone else around you in an MMO, it's a pretty cool concepts so cool it, it does sound badass like straight up it sounds fucking awesome if you can do that perma eclipse well the odds are it probably will only be active at certain periods of time and you can only do it in certain ways but yeah it, it's like again whenever i think of it uh, like any mechanic in a video game i always reverse engineer it immediately and think how can this be abused how can somebody take this and fucking just turn it into some bullshit Seems grievable. The developer yeah, exactly. on this particular aspect of the game, they said the area, the environment, and the player, these three factors influence each other, and we try very hard to keep the experience varied even in the same areas. All around, this is a very interesting and cool sounding system. Now let's go ahead and move on to talk a bit about the world and the traversal systems. Okay. Throne in Liberty is said to have a large, seamless open world to explore, as many MMOs do. However, they've mentioned that unlike a lot of modern day games in the genre, they hope to keep players immersed in the environment by less reliance on systems that reduce the sense of scale, specifically fast travel. Instead, they wanted to focus on traversal systems that you engage with directly. Our characters will have the ability to traverse the environment with things like a mantle or climbing of most objects that you see around you. Instead of having to walk around every low wall or every barrel that you see, you can hop over or climb onto it. Or, I think one of the reasons why I like traveling, so like if you compare that to BDO, like one of the reasons why traveling in BDO was not absolute garbage, and I, I do think that it is, it is still kind of garbage, is that you can auto run. Like that's why it's okay, is because like you don't have to be actively moving your character every second of the way. So like if they have auto run and it doesn't take that long, it's not going to be a big deal. But I am an advocate for fast travel. I think that. A lot of times, like, people think that they don't want travel in a game. It's like honeymoon phase stuff, right? So, like, at the beginning of the game, oh, well, everybody's okay with not fast traveling. But then, like, after you kind of get your, you, you've played the game enough, you understand what's going on, running from point A to point B becomes very annoying. And so, again, I, I hope that any of these ideals are not something that they're willing to handicap the game over having to look for one specific pathway to access a location, you will have many means of exploring the environment instead of single paths. We will also have a grapple hook. This can be used to pull ourselves up to higher terrain or specific locations. And rather than a traditional mount system, the game has us transforming into animals. They've showcased yeah, a few examples, that. such as large cats for land travel, dolphins for water, and birds for flight. This more grounded focus on transportation, the developer has said. I do think that they should also just have mounts. Because it's like, it, like, I don't know, I like collecting mounts in games, right? And so, like, I, I think it'd be cool if they had mounts, too. Uh, I, I don't think that these two need, th I don't think these two things need to be mutually exclusive. Is something they want to use to keep players connected to the world and the play space. So it seems that uh, no matter what class you play in Throne of Liberty, you're also going to yeah. be playing as a druid. <laughs> Some people are going to be put off by that, but...
personally, it is kind I of kind of like that feature. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, in general, they've really emphasized the sense of freedom of exploration here, saying that between your character's abilities to mantle, climb, and grapple, as well as the animal transformations, combining all of these things open up a lot of uh, problem solving to access inaccessible areas. They referenced how, for example, there might be no easy way to directly get into a fortress that has massive walls around it. But if you climb to a high enough height in the surrounding area you and then swap into in. your bird form, which will function like a glide, that you can yeah. then soar over the wall and into the fortress. In That's fact, cool. the ability to affect the weather that players have comes into play here as well, because some players will be able to, able to even change the direction of the wind, and this in turn can be used to glide even further and access more difficult to reach areas. Another big... I feel like having something like it's a... Uh you know, some, like, massive fucking, like, imagine, like, a staff that's, like, some super powerful legendary artifact weapon that you can use as, like, a key to change some sort of, uh, you know, like, weather control device or something like that, or you can cast a spell with it. That sounds really cool, but I just worry that these things will not be balanced properly. It's one of those instances where it's, like, there's a hundred ways it can go wrong and about two to three where it can go right. And I'm just worried that it's going to be one of the 100, you know? aspect of Throne of Liberty is going to be its storytelling, they said, with lots of interactions and dialogue with NPCs, with cutscenes, yeah. but also just That's telling good. a cut story in important. the background as you play. They said, in order for the story and worldview to be explained naturally in the game, various gameplay tools and directional techniques found primarily in adventure games were used. So we can expect this to be stuff like NPC chatter in the background as you walk through town, sure. telling a bit of the local narrative, or coming across lore events and uh, relevant locations out in the world as you're exploring, all of which help build up the narrative of the world that you're playing in. Now, outside of the information in developer interviews, we could also get some details out of the gameplay trailer as well. For example, we see plenty of examples of the game's action combat, and at a glance, yes, it does look quite similar to what we see as an action combat system in Black Desert Online. Although it is hard to be certain just from the trailer, in one of the interviews, they have talked about having a direct targeting system. I am not expecting this to be full on tab targeting per se, a la World of I, I really hope that they just go with the mix system. The mix system where like auto attacks and like basic attacks are effectively tab targeted, but actual abilities are aimed. That is, in my opinion, the best way to do it. Warcraft or Final Fantasy XIV, it is much more likely to be a soft lock system where aiming at a target, even if it's slightly off the mark, will cause your skills to strike. But from the trailer alone, we see plenty of examples of AoE and cleave abilities that do yeah. appear to be targetless. So yeah, I'm expecting a soft lock system. You'll point your spells in the relative vicinity of an enemy, but you don't need to necessarily like aim for headshots, for example. We also see what look to be a few story cutscenes. We see a bunch of environmental yeah, sure. interactions like the opening of chest and activating these shrines. We notice a mini very minimal UI, which I personally love, and I hope this sticks in the final version. Overly busy UIs are- I also agree with that. I think that a really, like, the reason why UIs are also bad, it's like kind of a, it's like a, it's kind of a weird or complicated reason, but I think it does matter. It's that whenever somebody's watching you play the game, they don't know what the fuck is going on if they're watching World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy, or, or like Black Desert. Like, they have no fucking idea what's happening on the screen. There's just a million different buffs. You have no idea what any of them are. There's a million menus and a million screens, like tracking things, different numbers, information, etc. I've always been of the mindset, less is more. Have a more removed UI. Like New World. New World has a very good UI. Uh, I also like Black, uh, not Black Desert, uh, fucking Lost Ark's UI. I, I think New World's UI is substantially better than that, though. So I would like to see more of the simple UIs that you can add more things to it if you want to, but at a base level, it's not necessary.
of my least Clean favorite things simple. in many yes. MMOs. I like the streamlined, simplified UI. And then yes. there's a bunch of large-scale PvE clips with a ton of players taking on these oversized world bosses. I think this is what's gotten most people excited about the game. This stuff just looks so cool. And then they wrap up the trailer with some PvP Castle Siege clips, which I also think look pretty slick. These systems and features and all of this stuff that we've covered that Throne of Liberty has, it all looks really, really cool. I, I am excited, and honestly, and I'm very looking forward to playing the game. Although I don't want to neglect the first part of this video, the fact that the game has been stuck in what is sometimes referred to as development hell. I mean, it's been in production. I feel like they said it might be in development hell, and that's an issue, but if it was going to come out this year, and they probably, like, what did they delay it? Probably like a few months or something like that? That's a very, very short time frame. It's not like they're saying this is coming out in 2024 or, you know, 2026. It's coming out very quickly. So, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like we're going to, this isn't going to be like this, you know, uh, it's, this is not like an oasis that the closer you get to it, the more it vanishes. It's, it's right around the corner. So I think it's too close to release for it to be a, you know, thing that just never gets released. ...for over a decade, far beyond the typical amount yeah. of time a game sees in development. I do imagine that they have reused yeah. or repurposed a lot of the work from the earlier versions. I don't think that it just all went into the trash can and they started from scratch in 2019. I mean, hey, just the fact that this game has a grapple hook, which we saw grapple hooks in that first 2011 reveal trailer, that's something, right? And while yeah, it sure. can be concerning, I also don't think that a long development cycle or even changing game styles is necessarily a death death sentence. We've had some high profile examples in the past with things like the original Halo, for example. That game started out as a real time strategy game before becoming a third person shooter before finally setting on being a first person shooter. Yeah, I'm not saying Throne and Liberty is going to That's be crazy. like the equivalent of a Halo. That was uh, that was just industry. Well, yeah, of course. Right. I mean, there are sometimes like a game like it originally is like this kind of a game. And then over time, it evolves and it becomes different. It's like New World was like that. It was originally like a survival game uh, like a pvp survival game and like now it's like more of like a you know like sandbox with like some like theme park element mmo without really a lot of like forced pvp so it changed a lot titan overwatch yeah many games have had this happen i don't think it's a uh it's not a death sentence Fining for console FPS, that game really uh, set the pacing going forward, leading into Steve the Jobs modern day. I don't think Throne of Liberty is going that. to be that. My only point is that I don't think that making dramatic changes during development has to be a death sentence. No. It has to be us writing the game That's off. Exactly but I, I do think that spending over 10 years in development uh, could play a role into the game's monetization. Well, it's also, it, it's problematic because that's also one of the reasons why, I think that's one of the big reasons why Diablo 3 was not very good. Is that Diablo 3 spent so much time in development that I think that they just had to redo things so often and it was bad at the end of it. Because I think that that's one of the reasons why it spent so long. And it just made it worse. So I don't know. But like, alright, let, let's see what he says about monetization. Because like, again, this is just all speculation. They have yet to lay out specifics on this, whether or not the game will have a base box price, have a subscription fee, will it be free? I just, I just wish that you had a game that has, like, in my opinion, just have a fucking game that you buy the game or you can play a free trial of the game and if you really like it, you can buy the game and you have a subscription type model like uh, the Crystalline Aura or a Warcraft sub. That either makes you able to do the new content or it makes it much more efficient like I, I like really it doesn't need to be some bullshit to play we are not totally sure we can however bet that either way this game will have microtransactions being a korean mmo does. from ncsoft they have a well-established track record for game, us to reference and just about every one of their games dip into various buckets of pay for convenience pay for materials yeah see that's what i i think that's the problem is like i'm totally okay with stuff like uh you know like pay for uh, you know, a, a new cosmetic mount or something like that. I mean, that I don't really give a fuck that much about it. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, I mean, if you're paying a sub, like in WoW, and, like, you bought the expansion, then it's a big deal. 
But like, if you're just pawn, if you're playing a game that's like pay to win, or sorry, it's not pay to win, uh, that's like free to play. Sorry, it's basically the same thing at this point. And maybe you bought a box and that's it. You're not paying a sub relatively uh, all the time. I don't think it's a, it's a big deal to have cosmetics being sold. You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it, it's like, but whenever you add in, the problem with like adding in pay for convenience stuff is the moment that you do that, you make it profitable to be inconvenient. And it removes the developer incentive to make the game easier to play or just more convenient in general. And I think that's a very dangerous path to go down. Pay for cosmetics with stats, so on and so on. I mean, it would be surprising if Throne in Liberty didn't have some combination of these things. So yeah. just keep your expectations in check. This will not be a set box price with no cash shop and no subscription fee. It's well, you just can't have that because I mean, you, you, can't, you can't have a game that's continuously updated if you can only sell it once like it's just it's not going to happen that's just not going to happen now ncsoft's cfo <laughs> exactly. did touch on the monetization True. a few months ago saying that he understands users concerns and promises to do his best to avoid the appearance of pay to win elements so they're going to hide it i like that okay smart guy chooses his words very carefully that tells you about all we need to know. Now, with that said, and considering the fact that the game has 10 years of development cost to recoup, I expect Throne and Liberty will be either free to play or have a low base price of like 20 to $40. And then there will be a cash shop. It will have microtransactions, probably for convenience, possibly materials, and almost certainly for cosmetics for sale as well. And maybe some subscription or a season pass on top of that. That is my expectation until we hear otherwise. Also yeah, I, I think that's it. Like in, in a perfect world, what is a perfect game with a perfect monetization structure? You know it, I know it, everybody knows it. Elden Ring. You wanna play the game? You buy the game. There it is. And then they might make more content later on. And you can buy DLC. And you can play the DLC too. You buy that too. And that's it. That's it. You just buy the game. That's it. That's the best thing. Now, for an online service game, which Elden Ring is not. But for an online service game, what do I want to see? I would vastly prefer something like the Crystalline Aura or a very heavy trial system like what Final Fantasy has, or, or some form of a sub that people that actively play the game can engage in to fund the game that is not maybe 100% mandatory, but it's like 80% mandatory, right? You kind of need it. It's the same thing as like in, in PoE. Oh, you don't need stash tabs? Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, you don't need hot water either. You can just, you know, go get cold water and put it under a fire with a pot and you can make it hotter. But yeah, okay, all right. But I, I would say you need hot water, okay? Let's, we're not caveman here. You're going to need hot water. So I'm okay with that. I think that's good. If they have cosmetics on top of that, and they're also asking you for buy for expansions, it's the same as WoW and it's dog shit. However, the worst thing is whenever you have pay for convenience. And again, it's because it profit incentivizes these people to make the game worse. That's what the problem is, man. I'm, I'm, very, I, I'm very worried about this. Like, uh, you know, you've got that in Tower of Fantasy a little bit. You've got that in uh, Lost Ark. Lost Ark is one of the worst ones for this. Now, the worst kind of pay to win is whenever a game, whenever a person who spends $5,000 is not as powerful as a person who spends $10,000. That's what the bad, that, that's the bad fucking pay to win. It's that a person can just spend more and more money and become more and more powerful. That's what's bad. If you have to spend under $40 of, you know, semi-mandatory microtransactions like POE stash tabs, cry me a fucking river. I don't care. They have to, they have to make money to keep making the game. This is just what's going to happen. However massive fucking pay to win like Diablo Immortal and to a lesser extent Lost Ark. And the only reason I say it's a lesser extent is because nobody can outgear gravity. 
However, Lost Ark is absolutely pay to win. I think Diablo Immortal is the worst example, though, that I can use. So of note and worth mentioning here are, is that they is have a, a second MMO in development called Project E. This game shares the same world and the same continent as Throne and Liberty, but weird. is in a more Korean style and theming as the E seemingly stands for Eastern. They have called these sister games. I am not sure exactly not how sure all of Korean. this will play out. We'll have to keep an eye out though. I just thought this was an interesting note. Okay, so what is next? Well, as of right now, the game is still scheduled to release in quarter four. 2022, which will put it sometime in the next four to five months. Yeah. Although it may seem unlikely given we still don't have a set release day, they reconfirmed a 2022 launch is happening as early as just a few days ago during their latest investor call. So this should be happening. And they also- And, and to be fair, to be certain on this, this was delayed. It has been delayed since that announcement just a few days ago from whenever this video was made. All right, yes, the game has been delayed to confirm that they will be running one or two stages of testing prior to release. I suspect this will come in the form of maybe one private invite only test and then a second more open but likely locked behind pre-orders or something test to take place just before launch. All it's very unfortunate that we're going to probably see a lot more of these early start type things that we saw with Lost Ark where people get to spend money and they can start the game earlier. I'm not a fan of this. It, it, it sucks because, like, I hate this. But if I was making a game, I would do it. Because, like, it's so beneficial. Like, it, it's, it's a win-win situation for a developer where they win twice. You, you make a lot of extra money. And on top of that, you get to get a headcount, a, a smaller headcount at the beginning of the game. So you have lead time to beef up your servers if you're expecting to have even more players than you had initially predicted. So it gives you lead time for like opening up more servers, being able to like test things at a smaller scale. It, there's just a lot of really, really big benefits to that. But I fucking hate it. It's, it sucks, but I would, I would do, I would do it. Which is to say, we will be getting our hands on this game feedback, almost players, certainly yeah. very, very soon. It has been quite a long journey for Throne and Liberty from a top-down hack-and-slash game with click-and-drag-based combat to a more modernized take yeah. that looks similar to Lost Ark to what we have today. I mean, it's crazy, honestly, to think how different the game that we're getting is compared to what it started out as. And while I have plenty of reservations with such a big shift in this game taking place to its incredibly long development and how that might play into monetization, I am, regardless, very interested in seeing how all of this plays out. Visually, I think the game yeah, looks good, too. especially for an MMO. They have some amazing- yeah, I think the visuals look amazing. Like, one big thing is, like, I, I like having a long draw distance. And, like, draw distance is, like, how far you can see into the horizon. I really like that, and I think that it adds so much scope for a video game. I, I think that's amazing sounding systems and mechanics with the dynamic weather and how that affects the terrain, combat, enemies that you fight, the big open world yeah. bot battles, the focus on cooperative and difficult PvE fights, the sieges, the way they're doing the traversal system, lots of really cool stuff and all around I am very very excited like I cannot wait to play it and either way it does look like we'll be getting our hands on it and playing this game sometime very soon in the next few months and I I'll tell you guys like I will play this game whenever it comes out like, I, I will usually play pretty much any game that comes out that is a game like this. I will play it. I will try it out. And I'll give you guys an honest opinion about it because it's a spend $1,000. Well, probably on the first day, yeah. After that, I mean, obviously, it'll go up from there. But, you know, we'll just have to wait and see for better or worse it's going to be quite the event like with any new mmo launch and especially one that has some interesting elements to it as throne and liberty does it's going to be a fun time to jump in with everyone else check it out enjoy the good stuff and rail on the bad stuff right as always yeah. it'll be a good time that is going to do it for <laughs> yeah, today's true. video guys thank you so much as usual for watching very hope true. you enjoy the content and i'll see you next time That's take it easy very nice very nice that's a very nice video I, I like that i mean like obviously the the game looks very uh like, I mean, I, I see a scene like this. It's like, okay, I want to play this game, right? I mean, like, this is, this is my kind of shit. 
I, I mean, a hundred fucking percent. This is this is my kind of shit. This is my kind of game. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm I'm excited. I'm glad to see it. Pay to grind. I mean, like, we'll see what happens, man. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and link you guys a video so y'all can watch that. Pr True, but New World did that to us too. Yeah, uh, it did. But I mean, I had fun playing New World at the beginning. I, I paid forty bucks for New World, or like fifty, what, however much it was. I don't remember. Um, and, and I had, I got my money's worth out of New World. Yeah, I mean, what, what, <laughs> like, I, I don't need it to, it doesn't need to be a life investment. It was a fun game. I had a good time. Yeah, you love cutting down trees. I did. I was the first person who could cut down red trees on my whole server. And nobody would fucking buy them. Because everybody, like, I, I was like the server second level 60. And I got my lumber working up to, like, fucking max because I figured out some... Like, basically, you could kill the dogs, and I had a hatchet that would do more damage to, like, the fucking angry earth. So I, I killed these dogs, and I would farm them, and I had, like, a perfect farming method. I farmed it out, and I mapped it out in my head while I was waiting for respawns. I'm like, this is going to take me, you know, six, uh, seven hours and 16 minutes. And seven hours and 16 minutes later, I was cutting down red fucking trees. And I tried to put them up on the auction house. Nobody would buy them. Nobody would fucking buy my red trees. I was furious, man. Yeah, tree wolves, not dogs. Yeah, it's a tree wolf. Whatever the fuck. Oh, Dancy, they didn't need me. Yeah. Because everybody, like, nobody had their lumber working skill that high. Nobody else needed this. I was so mad. What are they used for? Uh, making like a fucking uh, glittering ebony or whatever it is, like the uh, the high tier wood that you use for certain types of crafting uh, and, and other stuff too. But I think those are the main things, man. Same thing happened to me with mining. Yeah, you get the Ori Chalcum and nobody wants it. I was so fucking mad. Uh, we're gonna watch uh, Actman's video. It's the other one I want to take a look at. I don't know how many of these I'm really gonna get to today, but I wanna watch this one uh, at least for now, okay? And Actman obviously got demonetized, and um, I think we're on kind of like a fucking theme here. And, and let me link this video again in case you guys missed out on it. This is a, uh, I, I like forced gaming a lot. Um, I, I think I could say this, uh, you know, there's like a, a New World event. It was like a press event. And like, uh, like we got, like he and I asked questions to like the developers and shit. And so uh, that, that's going to come out of embargo, and like we'll be able to talk about that uh, pretty soon.